what you yeah yeah okay okay you can switch on the video man possible yeah we are live now sir ashna please yes sir hello everyone the white army is blessed to have dr shraddha pawar ma'am assistant professor from esi mc gulbarga with us to present and teach us the anatomy of ear with the permission of ma'am we can start the session yeah okay shall we begin yes please yes okay a very good evening to everyone and a very happy makar sankranti and happy new year uh, since this is my first class i wanted to start with something very basic and very important uh, that is the anatomy uh, so let's begin with the anatomy of ear so this is a diagrammatic picture which is uh, showing the ear from the external ear to the inner ear and that is how we divide the ear that is external ear middle ear and inner ear the external ear consists of pinna extra auditory canal and middle ear which is medial to the tympanic membrane consists of the ossicles but as the middle ear cleft is the middle ear cavity the eustachian tube and the mastoid air cell system and in medial to that is the inner ear okay as mentioned in the previous slide these are the parts of the ear so the external ear consists of pinna or the auricle and the external auditory canal all of which which is lateral to the tympanic membrane the middle ear cleft which is very important topic for the undergraduate especially ossification starts occurring excessive bone formation occurs and it it uh, forms over the uh, oval window as well causing fixation of the stapes stap and conductive hearing loss so there are certain anomalies or dysplasias that can also occur in the inner ear uh, this is more important uh, mcq point of view rather than for the ugs uh, there shebes dysplasia mondini's dysplasia alexander and michels dysplasia so it is named after uh, uh, whoever described the particular dysplasia and shebes dysplasia there is the anomaly in the formation of the cochlea and the saccule part of the inner ear mondini's is uh, usually there is two and a half to two three fourth turns of the cochlea in mondini's you have 1.5 uh, turns Alexander's is the basal turn of the cochlea is affected and hence the patient will have higher frequency hearing loss mitchell's aplasia now if you have observed everything else is dysplasia this is aplasia so there is complete non development of the inner ear so if there is a question where they'll ask uh, there is that is uh, cochlear implantation can be done in all the following anomalies except what would your answer be so there are these four options given and uh, the question is so cochlear implantation can be done in everything except in all the type of uh, anomalies except anybody so i have explained the type of dysplasia uh, in which of the following do you think that the cochlear implantation is not going to help michael say please yeah. yeah michael say please exactly because all this dysplasia is affecting one or the other part of the inner ear whereas michael's aplasia is complete non development of the cochlea so there is no use of cochlear implantation what can of course help the patient is brain stem implant in michael's aplasia so uh, let's start with the anatomy uh, proper let's start with external ear so i have highlighted the points which is uh, uh, like mcq based or a three marker for you people so pinna as described about the uh, embryology it is made up of a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage except the lobule and the outer part of the ac 
So there is an area in the pinna. So this is the pinna and the various parts which are uh, labeled. Now this is the tragus. This is the crux of the helix. Helix. This is anti helix, which again has the two crux. This is the extra auditory canal opening. This is anti tragus. Okay. This is the simba concha. This is the concha and this is the simba concha. Now, what I was trying to say is all this is made up of one single piece of uh, elastic cartilage, except for this area between the tragus and the crux of the helix. There is one area which is devoid of the cartilage. And the this area is known as incisura terminalis. And what is the surgical importance is uh, in endoral approach, whenever we want to take an incision, we prefer taking it here because that way will not be incising over the cartilage and avoiding the necrosis of the cartilage. So that is the importance of it. What is the importance of Simba Conca? Landmark for uh, McEwen's triangle. Yes, it is the cartilaginous landmark for McEwen's triangle. Yeah, this is Simba Conca. McEwen's triangle is again a three marker. This is also very, very important. That is the nerve supply of the pinna. So this is the lateral surface and the medial surface of the pinna. So lateral surface is supplied by, if you take the tragus and this anterior part of the crux of the helix is supplied by auricular temporal nerve, which is a branch of auricular temporal nerve is a branch of Trigeminal nerve. nerve. That is mandibular uh, nerve. Okay. So V3. So greater auricular nerve, which is uh, C2, C3 of the cervical plexus, auricular branch of vagus, also known as Arnold's nerve or Alderman's nerve, and lesser occipital nerve. Lesser occipital nerve supplies only the uh, posterior superior part of, I mean, medial surface superior part of the medial surface of the pinna. The rest is supplied by greater auricular and this part of the concha is supplied by both vagus as well as facial nerve. Facial nerve is not mentioned in the diagram, but it's also supplied by the facial nerve. So external auditory canal, uh, coming to the EAC. Now the length of the EAC is 24 mm long. One third is cartilaginous and uh, the medial two third is bony, which divides it into 8 mm and 16 mm. And this is the direction of the lateral and the medial part of the uh, external auditory canal. And since the lateral part is upwards, backwards, medially, you also have to pull the pinna upwards, backwards whenever you examine the external auditory canal. So since this is angulated in this way, you have to pull the pinna backwards so that it is in a straight line and you can see the visualize the tympanic membrane. So the importance of this, uh, the hair follicles are present only in the cartilaginous part of the uh, extraditic canal. So the importance being whenever there is furuncle, you know that it is coming, it is in the cartilaginous part because hair follicles are only present in that part. So there are two fissures or there is connection of the EAC with the other structures outside. That is fissure of Santorini, which is present in the cartilaginous part and foramen of Hushke, which is present in the bony part. So this uh, fissures or the foramens can pass the infection from the extraordinary canal to the parotid or the skull base or vice versa. From the parotid or the skull base, you can have the infection into the extraordinary canal. This is the uh, diagram to show you the nerve supply of the extraordinary canal. This is not of the tympanic membrane. So extraordinary canal anterior superiorly is V3, that is auricular temporal nerve. So antero inferiorly is the Arnold's nerve, C3 in the posterior inferior part, and uh, the facial nerve in the posterior superior part. Okay. So uh, the... Okay, uh, I do not have a picture for the nerve supply of the tympanic membrane, but uh, one, it is all the same. The anterior part is supplied by the auricular temporal and the posterior part is supplied by the Arnold's. 
facial nerve does not supply the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane please to remember this so what is the nerve supply on the medial medial surface of the tympanic membrane jacobson's nerve yeah jacobson's nerve which is a tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve so that is the nerve supply so since you know this nerve supply you will also understand the concept of referred otalgia isn't it so the same uh, nerve which is supplying all the extra auditory canal and the tympanic membrane so whenever there is lesion in any part of uh, the nerve supplying elsewhere you will have pain in the ear so the fifth nerve the has uh, referred from the tym tympano mandibular temporo mandibular joint uh, the tongue or the oral cavity the uh, all the dental caries dental abscess all this can cause referred otalgia ninth nerve can however be referred from the tonsil that is acute tonsillitis peritonsillar abscess or uh, tumors of the skull ba um, base of tongue and uh, the uh, vagus is from carcinoma of the larynx and hypopharynx and so ho however actually uh, in a case of we have seen many cases of uh, carcinoma of uh, piriform sinus and uh, the the actually first symptom being uh, referred otalgia so referred otalgia should not be ignored uh, if you do not find, whenever patient comes with otalgia and you do not find any a uh, lesion or any pathology in the ear always look for other sites where it can be referred so from the cervical spine it can be from the c2 c3 and nose and paranasal sinus again from the trigeminal so this is the most commonly asked question for uh, ugs in uh, ent what is that is anatomy of the middle ear cleft so first of all just mention the uh, contents of the middle ear cleft that is the tympanic cavity eustachian tube and the mastodesal system as explained the development you can also mention about the development how the middle ear cleft develops that is from the tuber tympanic recess which is from first and the second pharyngeal pouch so this is the mastodesal system the various air cells that is that it has um, the mastoid tip cells and uh, antrum is nothing but the largest mastoid air cell is the antrum so pharyngotympanic tube is nothing but the eustachian tube this is middle ear so obviously uh, this diagram they are trying to show that there is connect i mean this is whole of the cleft whatever we are saying the cavity the eustachian tube and the mastoid air cell system the tympanic membrane is uh, again a question so uh, the anatomy of the tympanic membrane you can describe the uh, development that it develops from all the three layers embryonic layers uh, then it it is pearly white and semi translucent membrane it's placed at the angle of 55 degree to the floor okay and this is the reason for cone of light so there are two parts of tympanic membrane this diagram is very important uh, please draw, draw a diagram So this is an endoscopic picture. So this is the tympanic membrane. Which side is this? Right side. Right side. Oh, so how do you tell it is right side? The tilt of the tympanic membrane and the cone of light in the antero inferior quad. Yes, very good. So we always look for the uh, cone of light and the angulation which is towards the right side. So that is how we know that it is a right-sided tympanic membrane. So uh, whenever they ask you a three mark or a five mark or based on tympanic membrane, please uh, mention about the development of the tympanic membrane. You can mention the color that is the pearly white or trans or uh, semi-translucent. Uh, it is. So this is the handle of the magnus. The tip of the The tip of the handle is actually uh, tented in in the center. So this portion is known as ambu, and uh, posterior, uh, anterior, inferiorly there is a light reflex formation. There are two parts actually: pars tensa and there is pars flaccida. The pars tensa has three layers, as mentioned, that is epithelial, fibrous, and mucosal layer. 
whereas pars flaccida uh, does not have a well formed fibrous layer any importance of this the name the name is given because the tensa is more tense and flaccida is flaccid so what is the surgical importance of this so where do you, uh, what is the most common site of uh, retraction pockets attic attic which involves which part attic is nothing but this cutum and the pars flaccida right so i want to ask i wanted to ask which part of the tympanic membrane is more prone for retraction pocket whether it is the tensa or the flaccida flaccida yeah it is the flaccida which is more uh, prone for retraction pocket because uh, that is what in the tensa all the three layers are formed well formed whereas in pars flaccida the uh, fibrous layer is uh, not formed properly and it is a thin layer compared to the pars tensa so that is why whenever there is negative middle layer pressure there is retraction pocket formation in the pars flaccida so uh, whenever this is a question you can mention about the embryology the color the angulation the parts of the uh, tympanic membrane and the layers of the tympanic membrane so notch of this is notch of remnants okay so now this is the the peripheral part of the tympanic membrane condenses to form the annulus so this whitish ring what you can see is the annulus this annulus however this is not a complete ring okay somewhere here <clears throat> sorry superiorly there is uh, the annulus is deficient and this is known as uh, notch of remnants so in the external layer um, mostly what is commonly asked is the tympanic membrane and the anatomy but middle layer is very very often the asked so if we can divide it into three parts again it is epitympanum mesotympanum and hypotympanum in the mesotympanum it is the part of the middle layer which is above the pars tensa and not pars flaccida so we have the scutum and the pars flaccida so epitympanum also includes pars flaccida so it is uh, whatever which is above the pars tensa so the middle layer which is medial to the pars tensa is the mesotympanum and below the pars tensa or the annulus is the hypotympanum which is the narrowest uh, part in these three mesotympanum yeah so that is a very doubtful answer but yes it is mesotympanum what happens is as i told you that uh, the uh, handle of uh, malleus is also tinted and it is uh, pulled medially okay so this curvature is medial and also there is uh, promontory okay basal turn of cochlea so because of these two structure this this becomes a very narrow space which is uh, almost about 2 mm so uh, whenever there is a question on the anatomy uh, so you know that uh, this this is an easier picture to understand it's actually a six sided box you know so you can uh, start your answer with each side so let's start with uh, the lateral side of the middle layer so the lateral border of the middle layer it is formed by the tympanic membrane okay and uh, tympanic membrane in the mesotympanum epitympanum or superiorly it is the scutum so very important is the posterior and the medial wall that is very important so let's begin with the medial wall so what is the structure you can see which is labeled as 5 is mentioned here this process is cochleariformis any significance of this identification of uh, first genu of the facial nerve so how do you identify so whenever you have the process of cochlear reformis where is it where is the first genu posterior anterior superior inferior to the superior process? superior to the 
process yeah so post so it is actually posterior superior to the process is cochlear reformis so the structures mainly what we can see on the uh, medial wall of the middle ear cavity is the process is cochlear reformis oval window round window a lateral semicircular canal so facial nerve enters the middle ear and it uh, takes first genu and it takes its uh, turn it is a horizontal segment of the facial nerve or the tympanic segment and then it turns around the pyramid and forms the vertical segment or the mastoid segment of the facial nerve so what all what is important is the facial nerve travels between the lateral semicircular canal and the oval window so oval window where the uh, foot plate of the stapes is attached so what is uh, so this is what is important here and there is promontory which is not uh, mentioned in this picture so there is promontory which is nothing but the impression of the basal turn of the cochlea bony cochlea and tympanic plexus which is present over the promontory so these are the important structures that you get in the medial wall of the middle ear so posteriorly what you can see is the pyramid okay uh, which is the origin of which muscle stapedius stapedius muscle and it attaches to the neck of stapes neck of the stapes and what is the uh, function of the stapedius muscle What does the stapedius muscle do? It is, uh, you're right. It Important and stapedial reflex muscle. Yes, it is. In, uh, it is the muscle which is responsible for the stapedial reflex, which is uh, that is a reflex uh, to a loud sound. Where whenever uh, the ear is exposed to a very loud sound, the stapedial reflex contracts and it prevents the excessive noise uh, transfer. I mean. A transmission to the inner ear through the oval window and that's why it prevents a noise trauma to the inner ear so that is its function so this is the pyramid and this is the vertical part and what is this uh, branch which is coming out from the facial nerve corda tympani corda tympani yes so this is corda tympani and you can see it is passing uh, through the uh, malleus handle of the malleus and the long process of the incus and exiting so it exits at the anterior actually it exits at the anterior uh, part of the tympanic uh, cavity uh, which is known as canal of ugear so which is what is this space which is present between the vertical segment and the corda tympani and this is fossa incudis okay where the short process this short process of the incus attaches here which is known as fossa incudis so which is what is the space and this is very very important to all the uh, ent surgeons sinus tympani no what is sinus tympani is a supra pyramidal uh, recess and it is a medial recess this is the pyramid and medial to the pyramid you have the sinus tympani somewhere here okay here you have the sinus tympani this is lateral to the pyramid this is the facial nerve the facial recess sorry so this is the facial recess okay so boundaries of the facial is very very often we asked so uh, can you tell me the boundaries now that you have the picture so it's a triangular area okay as you can see so what what could be the boundaries of the facial recess what do you have uh, medially what is the structure vertical segment vertical of the facial of the medially you have the vertical segment of the facial nerve laterally it is is the laser pointer uh, see on my screen Yes, ma'am. Yeah. What is the structure laterally? Corda tympani. 
Okay. So this is the facial recess where it is bonded medially by the vertical segment of the facial nerve, laterally by the caudal tympani, and superiorly by fossa and cutis. So this is very important. And this is, uh, as you mentioned, sinus tympani is medial to the pyramid. So this is the sinus tympani. Sinus tympani is, uh, the boundaries of it are superiorly, it has, superiorly it has, ponticulus and inferiorly it has subiculum. So this is the posterior uh, wall, okay? This is the importance of posterior wall. One, you have facial recess. Now, what is the importance of facial recess? Why was I stressing so much on the facial recess? In that posterior tympanotomy approach for cholesteatoma yeah. removal. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, this is not an approach for cholesteatoma uh, unless the cholesteatoma is very limited to this uh, this portion of the middle ear and you want to do a canal wall uh, intact technique. But most commonly, this facial recess is also an approach. Yes, it is a posterior tympanotomy approach, but it's most commonly, it can be used in uh, cochlear implant. So what they do is, now, this is the lateral part, okay? This comes here. Okay, are you getting it? They have just opened it like a book. They're trying to show it. So do I have another picture? Okay, yeah. So uh, what I was trying is, this is the facial nerve, okay, from the corda tympani and the uh, fossa incudis here. This is the facial nerve and this is your mastoid. Posteriorly comes your mastoid. So what, what we do is, we drill the mastoid we reach the mastoid antrum. Okay, this is the mastoid. We drill the mastoid. We reach the mastoid antrum. And between the facial nerve, so this is a diagrammatic picture, so you may not be able to catch it. But from this, we reach the facial recess, then pass the cochlear implantation is done and the wires are placed in the round window. Okay. So this is, this is an approach which can be used in cochlear implant. It can be used in any canal wall intact techniques. So, yeah, this is about the posterior wall. We're done with the medial wall. So, inferiorly, what we have is uh, the jugular yeah. bulb. Yeah. Sorry? So anteriorly, we have uh, the carotid and the sympath sympathetic plexus, uh, opening of the eustachian tube and the tensor tympani muscle. Until the tensor tympani muscle, it comes from the origin at the junction of the anterior and the posterior wall. And where does the tensor tympani muscle attach? Yes. Sorry? Your audio is not clear. Handle of my Okay, it actually does not attach to the handle. Few books have given us handle of malleus, but it actually attaches below the handle of the malleus. It attaches below the handle of malleus. And what does the tensor tympani muscle do? What is the action of the function of this muscle? Anybody? Okay, tensor tympani muscle is also a protective muscle. Whenever there is loud sound, what it does is it pulls, so since handle of the malleus is, is attached to the tympanic membrane, it pulls the TM inwards so that it is more tense and there is less transmission of the sound. But however, in this aspect, the stepidial reflex is always superior uh, to the tensor tympani. So these are the um, slides of whatever has been explained. Okay, this is the corda tympani. So uh, this is where it exits. It can be an MCQ. That is, what is canal of Yogya? It is the it is the uh, exit point of the corda tympani in the anterior portion of the tympanic cavity. 
the anterior wall of the EAC where it attaches to the middle ear, that junction that is an exit point of the cauda tympani. Which is this muscle which I was talking, which is coming from the pyramid and attaching to the neck of the stapes. This is the stapedius muscle. And this is the tensor tympani muscle. Okay. Not exactly over the um, handle of the malleus, it attaches below that neck. I mean, it's not over the neck of the malleus, it, it is below that. So, so these are the important points. Uh, editus ad antrum, I think I will mention about that one point. So, editus and antrum, uh, it is opening of the uh, there is an opening in the epitympanum and connects to the mastodantrum that is the editus at antrum. Fossa incudus, as shown, was uh, the area where the short process of the incus attaches. Uh, the posterior bulge, however, is over the medial wall. Pyramidal eminence with this tepidious uh, tendon of the muscle attaches. And then there is a vertical bulge of facial nerve and sinus tympani. So these, these two spaces are very important. It, uh, so you can mention the borders of these two spaces and draw a diagram. So I have a diagram for sinus tympani. See, superiorly ponticulus, subicular. Then there is uh, laterally, there is mastoid segment of facial nerve and medially the posterior semicircular canal. So importance of sinus tympani is uh, it is a hidden space. It's a very small space and it's a hidden space. So what happens is uh, this, we can leave behind some cholesteatoma in this space because it is the visualization of this space is restricted. So this can be a site, most common site for cholesteatoma recurrence. And that is why uh, this is important. Now this is facial nerve, if you assume, that is the vertical part of the facial nerve and this is the pyramid. Now this, that is what I was trying to say, it is the medial recess, medial to the facial nerve, whereas facial recess is lateral to it. This recess is lateral, whereas sinus tympani recess is medial to the pyramid. Now here the importance is whenever we are operating, it's a very small recess and it is not visualized because of this prominence. And that is why we may leave behind some cholesteatoma. So where it's very important uh, to, uh, before we wind up with a canal wall down mastectomy, you should always make sure that you have removed the cholesteatoma even from these recesses so that uh, the recurrence does not occur. So this is the boundary of the facial nerve. That is medially you have the vertical segment, laterally you have corner tympani, and superiorly you will have the fossa incudus. The anterior wall, uh, there is exit of the corda tympani, and there is a canal for tensor tympani. Actually, tensor tympani does not uh, rise as such from the anterior wall. It is at the junction of the anterior and the posterior wall. There is eustachian tube opening below, whereas above it is tensor tympani. And internal carotid artery is related uh, inferiorly, I mean, antro inferiorly, that's relation to the in internal carotid artery. So, medial part, these are the important structures uh, which you should explain. You should you can explain the uh, the entry of the facial nerve into the tympanic cavity. The first genu you know, and its turn as the tympanic horizontal segment or the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, which is situated between the lateral semicircular canal and the oval window, uh, can explain about the promontory and the tympanic plexus. So the contents of the middle ear is um, it has air. So can anybody guess what is the volume of the middle ear? What is the volume of middle ear? Six ml. No, volume. Volume is not mentioned in ml. No? Okay. So, uh, 
we'll keep that as the keep that answer in the last so the other uh, content is of course the ossicles there are two muscles as mentioned see stapedius and you know tensor tympani is not uh, quite oftenly asked whereas stapedius is very commonly asked so whenever they ask you the stapedius uh, just the stapedius muscle or the stapedius reflex you can mention about uh, what is the nerve supply of stapedius facial nerve facial nerve so you can mention its origin you can mention its insertion its nerve supply and uh, the function of the stapedius muscle that is the stapedial reflex so whenever they mention this i mean if it's only given as a three marker you can add all those points so there is obviously mucosal folds and ligaments which is again in itself a very huge topic uh, but uh, very rarely asked for under undergraduates in the blood vessels see okay. so this is the uh, tensor tympani which is attached here and what happens whenever there is loud sound it pulls the tympanic membrane inwards it causes tension in the tympanic membrane and thereby the sound transmission is reflected back and it's not transmitted anymore and uh, the stapedius also uh, does the same with the oval window but uh, in prevention of noise trauma or acoustic trauma stapedius muscle has a larger role to play than tensor tympani so eustachian tube uh, may be asked uh, especially the comparison of the uh, adult and the pediatric eustachian tube so the length is 36 uh, so directed anteriorly inferiorly medially it also forms an angulation of 45 degree now this is very important uh, especially if you compare it to the children who who have an horizontal eustachian tube So, what is the problem with the horizontal uh, eustachian tube? Now, in adults, it is angulated. Eustachian tube connects what structures? The tube has two ends, right? One is the anterior part. Now, as I already mentioned, the anterior wall of the use wall of the middle ear. There is opening of eustachian tube. What is the other end? Where does it connect to? nasopharynx nasopharynx so what happens if there is a horizontal eustachian tube without angulation effusion in middle ear or uh, effusion in middle ear effusion in middle ear is more or less because of the uh, negative middle ear pressure yes it is block of the eustachian tube which is not so common but what is more common in children is uh, the asom okay the transmission of infection from the nasopharynx to the ear effusion i mean serous otitis media effusion can also occur but that is more common in you know scuba diving or barrow trauma whenever there is lock of eustachian tube then there is negative middle ear pressure and vacuum created there is transfusion of the uh, fluid from the vessels that causes effusion whereas Uh, more common in children because of the anatomy is transmission of infection because urti is more common in children so that is transmitted so that is the uh, significance of this now I'll directly go to the okay so this is the diagram of eustachian tube it has a lateral lamina medial lamina elastic hinge it has levator palatini and tensor valley palatini and osmens pad of fat all these muscles and this pad of fat usually helps the helps in opening and uh, closure of the uh, eustachian tube so this is a very important table so this is the difference between an adult and infant eustachian tube and uh, this is the reason mainly why uh, there is transmission of infection because of less angulation also uh, the uh, the cartilage is more flaccid in infant and more rigid in case of adult all the uh, elastic recoil and the osmen pad of fat all helps in proper closure of the eustachian tube which is not there in infant so you can say this is more angulated than this 
So the functions is not, is the drainage of any secretions from the ear to the nasopharynx and also when ventilation and maintenance of the pressure. So when, that is why in, in case of ascent or descent, whenever there is rapid change in the pressure, in the atmospheric pressure, the eustachian tube gets locked and resulting in effusion. So there are two triangles which are, uh, apart from this, actually uh, one thing which I missed out was uh, the organ of corte, which has been asked as a question from middle year. So probably we can add that in the next topic. So the two triangles, which is important, McEwen's triangle again is very repeatedly asked. So McEwen's triangle is nothing but a landmark for the mastered antrum. Superiorly, it has supramastered crest. Anteriorly, it has posterior superior margin of the bony EAC. Posteriorly, it's a tangent which is drawn to the midpoint of these two lines. Okay. Do I have a diagram for that? Okay. So, so it's very important to uh, drill in this particular area because uh, ear is uh, ear is particularly uh, surrounded by very vital structures like superiorly there is dura, posteriorly there is sigmoid sinus, inferiorly there is uh, jugular bulb. So you really cannot uh, drill uh, vaguely from the master antrum. You have to you have to drill in this particular triangle uh, so as to reach the master antrum, and it's. Uh, almost about 1.2 to 1.5 centimeter deep to the triangle. And uh, there's one more triangle that is Trotman's triangle. Okay. So superiorly it has superior petrosal sinus, posteriorly the sigmoid sinus, anteriorly solid angle. This is a pathway to the posterior cranial fossa from the master. I'll try to show it in some picture if possible. So I do not have a picture of Trotman's triangle. So any mastered air, so if um, wherever that is. So as you know, in the mastoid we have, so posteriorly you have the posterior limit is the sigmoid sinus, right? So this, if this is the sigmoid sinus, there is a superior petrosal sinus here and lateral semicircular canal bulge, which you can always see uh, in the mastoid uh, region whenever you drill that. So if there is posteriorly sigmoid sinus, superiorly petros, superior petrosal sinus, this would be the area where you uh, drill so as to uh, reach the posterior cranial fossa. So mastered air cells can be one question. You can just draw a diagram and mention all the air cells. Uh, you can have mastered antrum, which is the largest air cells, and smaller air cells around the antrum, which is known as periantral cells. You can have squamous occipital air cells. Uh, you have dural cells, sinodural cells, perisinal cells, tip cells. Uh, along the facial nerve, there can be retrofacial uh, air cells. Peritubal cells are on the eustachian tube. Uh, anteriorly extension into the zygomatic arch can be the zygomatic air cells and into the petrous apex is the petrous apex air cells. Now this diagram you can draw. So these are all the air cells which are uh, uh, present. This is the antrum and this is periantral air cells. And this is the uh, sinodural angle. So sinodural dural cells anteriorly into the arch that is zygomatic air cells and medially into the apex there can be petrous apex or the peritubal air cells. So yes, that is it for today's class. Any queries or questions? Any doubts? No one. Ma'am, there's no doubts in the 
uh, amongst the participants as well as in the YouTube, ma'am. Sorry. Ma'am, the uh, ma'am, there is no doubts, ma'am. Uh, they have not. There is no doubts. Me. Okay. All right. Ma okay. Thank you. Ma'am, it was indeed a comprehensive clinical class, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the thank you for the such a succinct and such a brilliant presentation for ma'am such a topic that is fundamentally required in uh, ENT and uh, thanking all the participants for the active participation and uh, continuing the discussion in a fruitful manner. Um, I also thank all the YouTube participants who are who are currently viewing the discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ma'am, one doubt here, no? Yeah. Then why Trotman's triangle is more susceptible for erosion by cholesterol? Trotman's triangle is anterior. Uh, so anteriorly, see, that is what I told. The antrum, uh, the medial wall of the antrum is the posterior cranial fossa, and that is what the area is the Trotman's triangle. So it is surrounded by all the susceptible structures, and the area and the bony structure there is thinner than, than the other places. So whenever there is cholesteratoma in the mastoid, it is easier for the cholesteratoma to erode this bone and enter the posterior cranial fossa. But however, this is not as common as uh, the cholesteratoma present in the epitympanum and the uh, tegment tympani being ero eroded. Trotman's triangle is not very common area for the erosion in cholesteratoma. Okay, thank you. Shall we close the session, ma'am? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you.